All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us at the Difference Maker Kennedy College of Sciences COVID-19 Idea Hack. My name is Holly Butler and I am the Entrepreneurial Initiatives Program Director for Difference Maker. I just wanted to share a brief overview of this evening's events and Professor Wilkes will share the detailed agenda via the chat so that you can look at that throughout the event. So tonight we're all here to take action to solve COVID-19. And we have three expert researchers here who will share problems about the current pandemic. And then as participants, you will all be able to engage in an ideation activity to begin solving those COVID related problems. As many of you may already know, Difference Maker helps students pursue their ideas and also solve problems that they're passionate about. And additionally, Difference Maker is a fun interactive program that helps students feel connected to campus and their peers, especially during these virtual times that we're living in. Some resources that Difference Maker offers are some working space on campus, expert advisors and mentors to help guide student projects, workshops where you as students can build up new skills. We also assist with team building. We award over $70,000 in funding opportunities each year, much more. So there are also many benefits to getting involved with Difference Maker. So you can of course win funding and pursue your idea but we also understand that that's not for every student and that not all, all students will be pursuing their ideas long term. So other benefits include building up your network, meeting new friends, gaining job opportunities, learning new skills like time management and communication, having a safe place to fail and to try again, building up your resume, which is gaining a competitive advantage against your peers when you're looking for jobs in the marketplace, and again, the list goes on and on, as you can see from this slide. And as I mentioned, Difference Maker helps students solve problems. So I wanted to share just a couple of student team examples and success stories. So Ambulatory Innovations was a team that saw a problem in physical therapy clinics where there were no easy to use devices to help patients learn how to walk on various outdoor terrains. So this team actually developed a mat that mimics trains like sand and rocks and grass, which can help train patients. So since winning Difference Maker, they have raised about $30,000 in additional funding. And some exciting news, they've pitched and they've won national competitions against teams from MIT, Harvard, uh, and other Ivy League schools. They've also begun uh, building and testing their prototype with assistance from Difference Maker, as well as UMass's Innovation Hub and Nerve Center. And in this where I wanted to talk about, so they saw a problem related to safety. They saw that there was no fashionable safety device on the market and nothing that could connect a user directly to 911. So Invisaware solved this problem by developing a fashionable safety device. That's actually a button. So when you click it as a user, it can connect directly to emergency contacts as well as 911. Uh, and over here um, on the slide is actually a photo of the Invisaware technology. So as you can see, it's very fashionable. So since winning Difference Maker, they have actually raised over $1 million in additional funding. They've generated over $1 million in revenue They've saved multiple lives, and by doing so, they've actually been featured on national um, news television stations. They are currently operating uh, within an office in Lowell, uh, and they actually are employing a team of 10 people, which is really helping with the economic development um, of the city. So as you can see, our teams are doing really great things. And you're all here tonight, which uh, is a great first step forward uh, towards solving problems and making a positive impact in this world. So I do want to thank everyone who is here with us this evening. And before getting started, I just wanted to take a moment to introduce the Difference Maker faculty fellows. So these faculty are ambassadors for Difference Makers within their college, 
And they'll also be assisting with the ideation activity later this evening. So we have Mazen El Ghaziri and Brent Shell from the Zuckerberg College of Health Sciences, Mark Hughes and Iman Shaheen from the College of Education, Kathy Levy and Neil Shortland from the College of Fine Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, Hunter Mack, Carter Keough, and Kalia Wolkowitz from the Francis College of Engineering, Kevin Willett from the Manning School of Business, and lastly, Tom Wilkes from the Kennedy College of Sciences and who also helped to coordinate this event this evening. So I want to thank all the faculty fellows for their support. I'd also like to take a chance to recognize the Difference Maker team and also the IT and Events Department for their hard work. Um, so Stephen Tello, he's the Vice Provost for Graduate Professional and Online Studies and also oversees Difference Maker. Graham Allen, the Assistant Director in, of Media, AV, Hospitality and Event Services. Adam Dunbar, the Senior Associate Director of Student Affairs. Adam is actually the person behind tonight's Zoom meeting. So Adam, I wanna give a shout out to you. Uh, and then lastly, our student interns, Adam, Yeharn, and Victor, who will also be assisting with the activity later this evening. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Fred Martin, Professor of Computer Science and Associate Dean for Teaching, Learning, and Undergraduate Studies in the, Co the Kennedy College of Sciences, as well as Tom Wilkes, who's a professor in the Kennedy College of Sciences and Difference Maker Faculty Fellow. So they will provide more information about the partnership between Difference Maker and the Kennedy College of Sciences. So join me in welcoming Fred and Tom. Thanks, Holly. Um, and thank you for all the work that you've done organizing this event. Um, so I have a long title, uh, but pretty much what I do is I focus on the undergraduate experience in our college, the Kennedy College of Sciences. And as you can see from uh, that uh, on the screen that my own background is computer science. Um, so pretty much I'm just here to welcome you. Um, I'm looking forward to tonight's activities and in particular the uh, breakouts that we're going to do and that's where we're really the action happens. We generate ideas and I'll be helping to facilitate the debrief after that activity. Thanks everybody for being here. I'm looking forward to tonight. Hi, I'm Tom Wilkes. I am uh, a, a teaching faculty member in the computer science department, but uh, my role here tonight is as the uh, Difference Maker Faculty Fellow for Kennedy College of Sciences. And it's been my honor and uh, pleasure to represent uh, KCS in Difference Maker since uh, last year. So this is my second year as a faculty fellow. Um, it's, I'm really uh, glad that uh, the Dean and uh, Fred Martin came up uh, with the idea for this uh, particular um, meeting. This is our first uh, event uh, that we're co-sponsoring uh, between KCS and Difference Maker. So hopefully it'll be one in a long line of events like this. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank Holly uh, for putting all of this together and our IT partners uh, for making it uh, possible. And uh, I'll be uh, talking to you again just before our uh, ideation activity begins. So uh, I'll sign off for now. Excellent. Thank you for your support and collaboration, uh, Fred and Tom. It means a lot to Difference Maker and our students. So now it's my pleasure to introduce a very strong advocate of Difference Maker and its students, especially within the Kennedy College of Sciences. So as Tom had mentioned, the success of this event is due in large part to his support um, and sort of coming up with this idea and working with us on it. So please join me in welcoming uh, Nordine Makeshi, uh, the Dean of the Kennedy College of Sciences. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for putting this together. I know it's a lot of work and a lot of people have worked on this. So I want to thank everybody who's been involved with this. I want to thank Tom. I want to thank Fred, Holly, Fuzi here so with us and the whole team. I also want to thank, I saw Jim show here briefly, uh, my colleague, Jim, uh, who, who's the Dean of Engineering uh, for being with us here. I'm sure he has uh, 10,000 things to do this evening, but he's selected to be here. Really means a lot to us, uh, uh, Jim. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. For I also want to thank me. all the students. 
I, and, and if there's any Dean, also I want to thank everybody too. I, you know, I have missed some, but I also want students who are taking the time to come to this. So, um, so really this is about trying to get our students, not just from the Kennedy College of Sciences, students on campus, everybody to work together on trying to solve a really very big problem that we are facing as human beings. And, uh, and the problem is COVID-19, it has implications on health, uh, clearly also on economy, on, on a lot of things. So, so the idea was really that actually, I do believe that no one can come up with a solution by himself or by herself or by single field. It's trying to put people together and, and we will be surprised how, how, uh, how great ideas, innovative um, ideas can come up by putting uh, students uh, together from different fields, from different colleges and trying to, with experts, trying to walk, to, walk together uh, to find a solution, to propose a solution. So I'm really excited about this. I am sure that uh, we will learn a lot. If nothing else, we'll learn more about COVID-19. Uh, and I look forward to uh, learning about uh, how, uh, what science and engineering and business and uh, can contribute from UMass Lowell to solving this uh, big societal problem. And uh, um, I look forward to hearing the ideas that will come up here. And like you said, Holly, this is you want, not everything will work, not every idea will work, but uh, but it'll be a great experience for all our students, and I'm pretty sure they will have a lot learn a lot about COVID. So, thank you for doing this. Thank you all for being here this evening, and I look forward to uh, working and learning a lot. Thank you. Thank you for your support, Dean Malekshi. Um, you. So now you will be hearing from three expert researchers in the area of COVID-19. So each speaker will discuss a specific part of COVID-19, as well as the process for solving problems around the pandemic. And these speakers will really set the tone for the ideation activity, which is coming up shortly. So first, I would like to introduce Michael Graves. He is the Associate Chair in Department of Biology uh, in the Kennedy College of Sciences. So Michael, I'll pass it off to you. All right, is my screen up? Yes. Everybody, and everybody can hear me okay? I haven't screwed anything up? All right. So welcome, uh, good evening. I'm gonna start out being a biologist and a virologist and telling a little bit about the COVID virus, what it is and why it's a challenge and why it's, it just, it actually it's just an interesting virus in and of itself, but why, what are some of the challenges with this? So COVID is basically a member of a family called coronaviruses. And unlike the DNA genomes we have on our cells, these viruses have RNAs as their genome. And what's interesting about them, they're actually the largest RNA virus known. The genomes range anywhere from 27,000 to 30,000 bases of RNA. That's about three times the size of HIV and twice the size of influenza genomes. So they're quite large viruses, which makes them interesting in that self. If you look at the virus particle, this is called an envelope virus. It has a membrane around the side of it. And what I'm going to talk about here is we keep hearing about these things called the spike proteins up here, these little spikes on the surface of the virus. So all animal viruses, in order to get into a cell, there has to be some protein or structure on the surface of the virus that's going to attach to something on the surface of the cell. And that's what determines what cell the virus is going to attach to what, virus is, what cell the virus can infect the attachment protein to the virus, and does the cell basically express the protein to what that thing can attach? So the spike protein of um, here, so the spike protein of coronavirus attaches to something on the surfaces of a cell called ACE2 or ACE2. All right, this is a protein then that's involved in regulating blood pressure, all right? And it's present on cells in the lungs, the arteries, the heart, the kidney, the intestines, which means this virus can actually have the potential to infect a lot of different organs and tissues because of the, the, where, where this receptor resides. It's on a lot of different cells, which means the virus can attach to and infect a lot of different types of cells. All right. So if we look at the family, this is a very large family of viruses. There's viruses of the humans and pigs and cats and dogs and bats and birds. 
and they basically cause a lot of different types of diseases. So it's a very broad virus and affects a lot of different types of animals and causing a lot of different types of diseases. Okay. In humans, coronaviruses are actually responsible for about 30% of the common colds in humans. They also tend to be associated with outbreaks. When somebody says, oh, there's something going around at my work, or oh, there's something going around at my school, there's a tendency for those to be coronaviruses because they can be very highly contagious. So some of the coronaviruses of note to us in humans, there's, there was a severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS coronavirus, which appeared in China in 2002, mild respiratory disease all the way up to death, uh, infected 29 countries, over 8,000 confirmed cases, over 700 confirmed deaths, 96, I get my mouse, here's my mouse right here, 96 or 9.6 percent mortality rate. There have been no new cases of this since July 2003, and part of the issue is probably because of the high mortality rate. You kill, you kill your host too quickly, the virus doesn't spread as far. There's then the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS coronavirus, which appeared in Saudi Arabia in 2012, anywhere from asymptomatic to death, you know, and then various respiratory illnesses. 27 countries, 2,500 confirmed cases, 800 over 800, 800 confirmed deaths, 34.4% mortality. This is still ongoing. This virus still appears in the Middle East. All right. Now, this is interesting because it has a high mortality rate. So why did it never become a pandemic? You know, why did this never really spread? And part of the issue is the fact that this virus does not spread human to human very well. It only spreads under human to human under very close contact like in healthcare settings. So that's one reason it never went to a pandemic. It's not very efficiently spread and also because it has a 34.4% mortality rate. So how is it still out there? We'll talk about that in a second, about why that virus is still out there. And of course, we now have COVID or SARS coronavirus 2 that appeared in China in 2019, as we all know. It can be anywhere from asymptomatic, mild respiratory diseases up to death. Some other interesting symptomology that's associated with this virus, this thing called a cyclone storm. Some people get this. Their immune response just goes nuts, absolutely overreacts to the virus, and it can actually kill you very quickly because of this. You can have hypoxia, that's low blood oxygen, blood clotting, some patients' blood basically turns to gelatin, and that's fatal. You can have loss of smell or taste has been associated with this, and even cognitive effects on some people. So again, everybody knows the numbers, 190 countries. These were taken off the, uh, the uh, John Hopkins site last week, 49 million confirmed cases, 1.2 million confirmed deaths, running at a mortality rate of about 2.5%. The United States, of course, we have the most cases, over 9 million confirmed cases, 200 some odd thousand confirmed deaths, about 2.4% mortality. Massachusetts, over 160,000 cases, over 10,000 confirmed deaths, 6.1% mortality. That's kind of been interesting. Why is the mortality rate in Massachusetts so high when around the world it's 2.5%? Right. So what are the challenges of COVID-19? Well, first of all, like a lot of coronaviruses, it's highly contagious. This thing spreads in aerosoling, direct contact, fecal to oral transmission, contact with contaminated surfaces. So it's a highly contagious virus. Wide variability in symptomology, especially the issue that 40% of people who test positive are asymptomatic. They do not know they have the virus, but those people still may be contagious. So someone could be walking around having this virus, not knowing they have it and basically spreading it to other people. You know, mostly if you get like flu, you get sick, you stay home, right? Which helps limit the spread. But with COVID, you may not know you have it. 40% of the people don't even know they have it, right? Another challenge is this virus is what's called a zoonote, zoonosis. And these are viruses that infect other species in addition to humans. You've heard of rabies, influenza, West Nile, Eastern equine encephalitis virus, hantaviruses. So these all are viruses that can infect other animals and us. And so these other species are especially known as a reservoir host. So the virus can replicate and evolve in these other hosts and then jump back in humans. So that makes these viruses very hard to control and eradicate because yeah, we can vaccinate people against them, but then these viruses go off and infect something else and then come back to us. And this is one reason why we need a new flu vaccine every year, because the virus goes off, it can infect birds and pigs and other animals and then jump back into us. 
right? So vaccination has vastly reduced viruses like measles, mumps, rubella, polio, but those are viruses that only infect humans. And so we can basically, basically inoculate humans, get the virus out of humans, and the virus has nowhere else to go, okay? So if we look at MERS, why is MERS still out there? Well, it turns out, even though human-to-human -human, uh, spread is, is rare in MERS, MERS has a reservoir host of dromedary camels. That's these guys up here. So the virus is floating around in camels, apparently. And so people live with camels. Camels is a domesticated species. People live in close contact. So it looks like the virus is actually going then from the camels into people. And the camel now is the reservoir host where the virus is hanging out. You look at SARS coronavirus 1 and SARS coronavirus 2, when they were both discovered, they found viruses like those SARS coronavirus in something called a mast palm civet. This little guy right here, it's a mast palm civet. And they found SARS coronavirus 2 in this thing called a pangolin or a scaly anteater. These are animals that are being sold in open markets in China. So again, people are bringing these animals into human contact, exposing ourselves to the viruses they carry. They've also found coronavirus, the SARS coronavirus one and two in bats. They found other viruses in bats as well. So bats can serve as a, as a basically a reservoir for this. So these viruses can float around out there, then they get into other animals and then they can get into us. All right. So now before anyone suggests maybe let's go out and wipe out all the pangolins and the fast palm civets and the camels and the bats and all that, remember this is largely our own fault. All right. This is all affected by human activity. All right. We are basically encroaching onto their habitats. We're destroying their habitats and urbanization. We're bringing the animals into you know, our marketplaces and zoos and all that kind of stuff. So we're basically exposing ourselves to those. All right. So another challenge is the fact that RNA viruses, RNA genomes have a very high mutation rate when they replicate. So the mutation rate of an RNA genome is about one in 10,000 to one in 10,000. For a DNA genome, it's about one in a billion. So that means these viruses can rapidly evolve, which means they can get resistance to the immune response. That's idea like a vaccine. And another reason why we need a new black uh, flu vaccine every year is not only do these viruses go out and infect other hosts, but then they change, they evolve, they mutate in those other hosts and then come back to us, all right? This also allows these viruses to evolve drug resistance. So in the early days of HIV, coming up with HIV drugs, they basically just selected for drug resistant isolates. On the good side, though, high mutation rates mean that virus, these things can sometimes mutate themselves to exist to extinction. They just mutate so much they can't survive. It also makes them susceptible to something called uh, nucleoside analog drugs. So nucleoside analogs are basically messed up bases that, are, that, that RNA are made from. So the A, the C, the U, the molecules from which RNA made, these are mimics of those. And so you basically give somebody a drug like that, when the replicase is copying the RNA genome, it incorporates one of these messed up bases into the genome that messes up the genome, kills the virus. So if you look on TV and you see ads for uh, hepatitis C virus drugs or HIV drugs, those are largely nucleoside analog drugs, which mess up genome replication. So these are a common drug that's being developed to treat RNA viruses. The problem with coronavirus is that they actually have this thing called an editing mechanism. So if they actually, what happens, it provides basically what's called proofreading. So basically if the virus is replicated in its genome and it incorporates one of these analogs into the genome, the editing function can remove it, repair it, and the virus then continue to replicate, indicating that these viruses might be resistant to these common types of drugs. So that's a, that's a, so basically a drug resistant mechanism might be a, a challenge with coronaviruses. So now as we're thinking about coronaviruses, how we're gonna this pandemic and how we deal with it, the other thing we have to kind of do as well is kind of think ahead to the next pandemic because it's not if, but when and what, right? Another coronavirus possibly. We've already had now three coronaviruses come out and, and animals into us in the last couple, in the last two decades. What about influenza? There's Spanish flu of 1918, 1920. 27% of the world's population was infected with that. Death toll of anywhere from 17 to 100 million people. 
The swine flu outbreak of 2009, anywhere from 700 million to 1.4 million cases of that. You've ever heard of the Disneyland measles outbreak in December 2014, February 2015, right? So measles, we have, a, we have a vaccine to that. That's a virus we thought was gone. We eradicated it from the United States and all of a sudden we had an outbreak. This was largely fueled by anti-vaxxers who didn't get their kids vaccinated, thinking that, well, we don't have to because the virus isn't there anymore, so we don't have to worry about a vaccination. But what happens? You got a whole bunch of kids who weren't vaccinated all together at the same time, at the same place with somebody who had measles, and all of a sudden the virus spread. And so the, the rule, the kind of the point there is that, you know, wear your mask how quickly things like these things can spread if you don't follow the protocols. You don't get vaccinated, you don't take the precautions. These things can spread very rapidly. Uh, rubella like German measles. So we, again, we have a vaccine for rubella. Uh, rubella was first characterized in 1962. It causes German measles. It's the own it's its own virus in its own family. We only thought it infected humans, kind of forgot about it because we have a vaccine to it. This year, they found two new rubella-like viruses in animals, one in bats in Uganda and one in zoo animals in Germany, as well as mice running around the zoo in Germany. So again, here's a virus we know has been able to infect humans. It's caused a nasty disease in humans. We've kind of forgotten about it because we have a vaccine, but it's out there in other animals. And we're bringing these animals in close proximity with us. And then finally, the X virus. What do we mean by the X virus? Everything has a virus. Every animal, plant, fungi, bacteria can be infected with a virus. There are even viruses of viruses. So the potential for viruses to spread into the human population and then basically spread through us is always gonna be there. All right, so something again, as we think about how to deal with COVID, we can also think ahead about, okay, what about the next one? And what have we learned from COVID that we can apply to the next one? And so everybody again has seen these numbers. These are the basically the COVID spread over the world. The red line here, this is when we bailed to home in March and we can see the daily cases throughout the year. We are all worried about whether or not there'd be a spike in the fall. There is, that's why the governor has imposed some new restrictions. And in the famous words of Yogi Berra, it ain't over until it's over. And so we're still in the midst of this thing. And so that's all I have to say. I will just leave you with one little animation of this, that it's just some virus that's going around. Thank you, Michael. That was very informative. Um, and next up, I would like to introduce Erno Sajo, uh, Professor and Director of Medical Physics in the Kennedy College of, Sci of Sciences. So Erno, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation. And really, I'm impressed that so many people are showing up and, and of course are interested in this. So, so let me um, focus now a little bit on the aerosol component, because as, as we see and hear it, that aerosol, the, the virus is aerosolized, and sometimes we hear that it is in the air. And so, and in other words, the likely disease, one of the likely disease transmission routes is via the airborne way. So that's why we have to wear our face mask, keep the distance. And one of, the, uh, one of the overarching concerns is that once you are in a building, eventually, hopefully, we are going to try to open up our lives to, to normalcy. Uh, the building HVAC system can potentially pick up the virus in a room where there is a COVID patient who might be silent, silent in a sense that, that uh, there, is, there is no obvious signs of being ill, but still, even at that stage, the person can contaminate and can spread the virus. So the HVAC system, by way of their intake, can pick this up and spread, in theory at least, and not just theory actually in measurements, uh, it can spread to other rooms. Not only that, uh, the HVAC system can also become contaminated because the virus will plate out, will deposit, settle on the surfaces and then become, can become re-aerosolized. In this way, it can spread the virus after the room where the patient is empty or has been even contaminated. So this can go on for a period of time. So in this way, potentially a fairly large population can be affected in universities, of course, because of classrooms hospitals of for obvious reasons and, and even office buildings and homes. The, the uh, question is, of course, that once this exhaled aerosolized, how does it look like? 
coughing, sneezing, and normal talk will all result in a generation of saliva droplets of various sizes. And here is here's an example that you can oops, here's an example that you can see here, which is uh, by some some noted researchers who measure this. This doesn't happen to be COVID uh, virus. This is just saliva droplets as we cough, exhale, or sneeze, they are just about the same way they behave. The size distribution is just about the same, except the number of them or the total volume that is excreted is different. And as you can see, this is a size distribution. On the horizontal axis, you see the diameter of the particle. This happens to be the microns. And the, on the vertical axis is either the number of them or in this particular uh, figure, it is the partial volume that, that, that uh, is, is a fractional volume that occupies uh, a finite compartment. And it's a multimodal distribution. So it has many different modes or peaks, as you see. The most dominant one is about eight microns, but extending down to about one micron. <clears throat> the do droplet size that the overall range is, is between roughly one and 30 microns. And each one of these droplets may contain some viral RNA copies. And as you heard, the single virus is roughly between 120 to 160 nanometers. So one aerosol droplet, one saliva droplet can contain multiple, maybe none, maybe one, two, or multiple viruses. So that is a subject of intensive research of how many uh, viral copies uh, the, the aerosol droplets may contain. And these droplets, of course, become aerosolized. So, so what does it mean that, that uh, aerosolized? It's, you know, aerosols are fine particles or droplets that are suspended in air. They are so fine that they can be indefinitely suspended because of normal air currents, air movements in an enclosed space, for example, in a classroom, well, maybe at a home. The, the airspeed is approximately two centimeters per second. The, in, 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 in a classroom environment where it's forced ventilation, it's about five centimeters per second. And the reason why we have these low air speeds is because otherwise humans would feel that the place is drafty. It's going to be very uncomfortable to sit and, and work. The aerosols in this way suspended are the proverbial moving targets. In fact, worse than the moving targets. It's, it's a nightmare to track them down. They can collide midair. If, if you have high density of aerosols, they can collide in midair because of air motion, differential air motion, and because of many different uh, governing forces, even acoustic forces will drive these particles, electrostatic forces, gravitational settling, etc., Brownian motion, will all lead them to coagulate, or sometimes we call them agglomerate, and form larger particles or droplets. They also tend to deposit onto surfaces via diffusion, gravitational settling, and, and if it's in a moving airstream, by inertial impingement. Diffusion deposition, diffusion deposition doesn't seem to be a very, very dramatic effect, right? Well, no, if, the, if, if you're looking at in the middle of the room, but if the particle is close to a surface, diffusion can become a very effective way to deposit. And especially if the surface is cool surface, we, we have a, a, an, an effect called thermal freezes. These particles can also evaporate if they are liquid. So thereby changing their size while they are moving and this is exactly what happens once, uh, once a virus, once, once somebody, for example, coughs and, uh, and, and sneezes, the initial plume will be depleted by way of a gravitational settling, but also by immediate entrainment of the air contributing to uh, evaporation and making the aerosol size smaller. So in this way, these aerosols can travel with air currents very readily, but how readily? It depends on their size. Small particles can travel with air currents more readily than large particles for obvious reasons, because of gravitational settling, because of impingement. So the size distribution is one of the most important characteristics of this aerosol. Not all particles are made the same. 
and their size affects the mobility, settling rate, and various other important characteristics. Um, and it changes over time due to coagulation, due to deposition, due to evaporation, and various other uh, methods. So here is a, a, um, an animation that I'd like to show you. This is a, this is an animation of, uh, of simulations that my group did and the University of no, Sorry to interrupt your, um, um... You just want to, you're on uh, broadcast mode. You just want to switch it over. You can't see the animation. My apologies. Okay. So am I ready to do the animation? Uh, you can try it, but it's, uh, we just can't see it on our end because. Well, oh, you cannot see it on your end. Yeah, it's in, you're in edit mode. So if you just. Oh, uh, I am in edit mode. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, you are right. No problem. I just want people to be able to see your animation. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. And thank you. So. So here is, here is an animation of three dimensions. As you can see, small particles eventually become large ones as they agglomerate and they, they collide because of various forces. And, uh, and as, a, as a consequence, uh, they will be more ready to de deposit by gravitational settling, but less ready to deposit by diffusion, for example. Here is another animation that shows an initial particle size depression to, with two modes, one in the lower end and the other one in the higher end. And as you will see, over time, the large particles will deplete. They fall to ground, literally. And uh, dramatically, small particles are much less effective. So this, this is how it, it changes. And let me rock it back and forth to show you how quickly the high part, the large particles settle on, on, onto, onto surfaces, while in the same time, the smaller particles barely undergo any uh, change over, over a long time interval. It takes a long time interval for the small particles to settle or somehow get removed from the um, aerosol field. So what is important here is the fraction that deposits it becomes fomites. So they will, you can, by touching things, you can pick it up and by touching your air, uh, your, your face, eyes, um, uh, you, can, you can get infected. The fraction that remains airborne is the smallest droplets. And that is usually in what we call the respirable range. The respirable range of an aerosol is that size range which has the potential to reach the deepest layers of the, of the lung, the alveolar region. Um, and this is the least likely to settle out. This is the least likely to undergo various other mechanisms that will remove them from the air. So this, this is a simulation. This is actually a real COVID simulation um, using uh, COVID excretion rates by coughing the um, in in a uh, in a room uh, which is poorly ventilated, and uh, we place a, there's an initial size distribution by the initial cup of a patient in this room, in this poorly ventilated room, and over periodic coughing, which has been measured by investigators, um, uh, on average a COVID patient overnight uh, coughs uh, about uh, on about four minutes. Per, uh, on, uh, on, uh, per cuff on every. So overnight, the, because of the, of, of the uh, uh, preferential depletion of the larger particles, the buildup of the large particles in the air is not as dramatic. So as you can see here, these are the largest particles. These are the eight micron particles. They build up over time as the patient is coughing in the, in the room by a factor of about maybe eight. In the same time, the buildup of smaller particles is dramatically by a factor of about uh, uh, two orders of magnitude, as you can see, it's a factor of about 100. And that is because particles in this size range are not being depleted, they, they stay airborne, while in the same time, small, larger particles evaporate largely so from large particles, it becomes small particles. And in this range, as you see, suddenly 
particles that are smaller than the initial particles that were carved out suddenly start to appear. And that is because of the evaporation of very large droplets over time. In the same time, the, uh, these larger particles uh, uh, deplete at a higher rate than the smaller rate. So that's why you see this lopsided evolution. The uh, problem with this, the buildup of these very small particles is that face masks and filters are less effective in this range. And the bad news is that if a, uh, if a smoke particle can go through a face mask, then a virus can also go through the face mask because they are just about the same size range. Some smoke particles are much smaller, so not all smoke particles are about the same as a virus. So it depends on what smoke you are looking at, but generally you can compare them to small particles. So here is a, an animation, and this is also based on computer simulation in an HVAC system. And this is a wireframe um, where you can see this is a source of aerosols. This is actually a, a, a single cuff of an aerosol. This, is, this is, happens to be COVID aerosol based on published data. And this is a wireframe of a simple duct system with an elbow in it. So it connects one room to the other room. We put, I put a, a pressure differential between the two rooms, which is simulating, you know, air conditioning or, or, or HVAC behavior and see how this uh, one cough, which is uh, presumably picked up by the register in one room, will transport it to another room. What is striking here is that the particles will deposit. And this is a little bit exaggerated, so you can actually see this. Um, so uh, uh, concentrations are scaled to show the deposition. But these deposit onto various surfaces in the, in the duct system that eventually can be, re can be resuspended and re aerosolized. So um, the interesting thing is that because of this deposition, um, not only, of course, can be re, re aerosolized, but, but the air conditioning system or the HVAC system itself can act as a filter, uh, but it can also contaminate in the same time other rooms in the building. So this is a, a, a good news, bad news. So, so the task is that, that we know that the airborne virus spends seconds to minutes in the duct system and the fraction of it deposits there. And the further, further fraction deposits on other parts, not just the duct surface, but of course, the HVA system has many parts, even moving parts. So, so of course, our goal is, one, is to prevent the virus spread uh, from one contaminated room to others and, and throughout the building. The reduction in concentration in other rooms, we like to see what we call a log three reduction. That means a thousandfold. So a logarithmic scale, uh, three log, the thousand fold reduction. But it all depends on the initial contamination level. And, how, and the question is, can we use, and if we can, how, uh, use the HVAC system as means to inactivate this virus? So thank you very much. And I, I think this is all that, that um, I have for today. Excellent presentation. Uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Erno. Um, lastly, we have uh, Susanna Remmelt. She's a professor and department chair in biological sciences in the Kennedy College of Sciences. So Susanna, I will pass it off to you. Thank you. Let's see if I can share this. So is that working? Can you see my slide? Okay. Um, I am going to shift gears and not talk about COVID. What I'm going to talk about is the process of what do we do when we have a good idea. So what we're about to do is go from a listening mode um, into an active mode. And I want to discuss a little bit how the scientific process influences the way that we go about doing this. 
Um, so what we're going to do today is talk about a problem um, and uh, think about a proposed innovation. What we're going to next need to do is think about what are your questions and hypotheses that you need to address in order to move that project forward. And specifically, as you do that, what do you need to compare against what to address those questions and hypotheses? So these are core questions that take you through a scientific process of evaluating a broad area, developing specific questions, and developing experiments that will address those questions and answer them. So the example that we're gonna talk about today is related but very old. Um, it's the basic problem that microbes in general, bacteria, viruses, fungi, on skin can pose infection risks. And a group of innovators um, had the, uh, the goal of creating a new compound that will kill microbes and decrease people's exposure. So that's pretty logical. Um, in the late 1960s, a group uh, uh, came up with a compound which is named triclosan. Um, and the idea is to put this in products that will help um, protect people in particular in terms of skin exposure. So we have a proposed innovation, just like we talked about at the beginning. This proposed innovation is the use of triclosan. I'd like you to think for a second, second, what is the critical question that is necessary to evaluate that innovation? So that's that step that you're gonna be doing today as you go from your innovation through the development process. So what these people did, and many people working with this compound, is ask the question, does triclosan kill microbes well? Um, to talk about how they evaluated this, we need to briefly uh, identify this, this, um, this approach, which is to quantify a minimum inhibitory concentration which is the lowest concentration of a compound that can inhibit visible growth. So what you do is you start, you, you make a gradient of your agent from no, in this case, triclosan up to very high concentrations of triclosan. And then you inoculate with your microbe of interest. You're gonna have lots of growth in the absence of your antimicrobial agent and it will go down um, as the concentration goes up. And what you're looking for is this here, this minimum concentration at which you get inhibition of growth. And you want this number to be as low as possible. That means that you need little drug or compound to have a strong effect in terms in, of inhibiting microbes. So a low MIC means that the compound is more effective at killing or inhibiting growth of the microbe being tested. So this is uh, quite an old experiment um, uh, and there's many, this is one out of many. So this is a heavily studied compound. Um, but this group quantified the MIC of triclosan and they looked at many different kinds of bacteria, yeast and fungi, right? Because this is, the goal of this is to have it uh, be useful in a broad sense, not for one particular pathogen. Um, and they tested many different types of antimicrobials so that they could compare triclosan against other things that are being used uh, for um, uh, other, other antimicrobials that are currently in use. And basically what they're looking for is a pattern like this. They wanted to see that their triclosan was going to result in a lower MIC than all of the other compounds that they were looking for. And they wanted to see that across multiple bacterial species, viral species, so on. So what they concluded is that of the substances they tested, triclosan was found to display a high degree of activity against most of the tested organisms. In other words, the MICs were low and, uh, and they got good killing or inhibition. And they found that triclosan had the broadest spectrum of chemotherapeutically significant antimicrobial activities. 
So they concluded, and, and many others concluded, that triclosan was a good candidate for use in uh, antimicrobial products. And in fact, um, it was very, it, very soon after its development, it was found in products for uh, cleaning skin in hospitals. But by 1972, it was also available in over-the-counter personal care products like soap. I'm, I'm sort of pulling out soft soap here, but Dial was the biggest company um, that sold triclosan containing antibacterial soap and did so for many, many years. Okay, are we done here? Well, it's a little bit like the protagonist is, you know, in the, in the battle midway through the movie. We must not be done, right? So what is still missing in this story? And I'm gonna give you a second to think about it. What's missing in this story? So this first study that I showed you compared triclosan against the wrong thing given the proposed use. They compared it to either no intervention or to intervention with, um, with other antimicrobials. What they needed to compare it to was the current most effective intervention. At that point, the most effective intervention, the most commonly used intervention was soap. So this is a different study from 35 years later about um, where the efficacy of triclosan in personal care products is being tested correctly. So again, like the previous study, these researchers looked at survival of many different bacteria in the presence of triclosan, but they only had three treatments. They didn't look at a whole bunch of different antimicrobials. They looked at no product at all, soap alone, and soap plus triclosan, and that's it in this study. So their data looks something like this. This is the bacterial population size with no product, with soap alone, and with soap plus triclosan. And if you compare no product to soap alone, you find that indeed triclosan with soap kills bacteria. So does it kill bacteria? Yes, it does. But this other comparison between these two bars, the soap alone and the soap plus triclosan bar in this example, um, addresses the question, does the triclosan soap combination kill better than soap alone? And the answer in the graph I'm showing you here is no, it does not. And in fact, these are their data from uh, tests of uh, a large number of both gram positive and gram negative bacteria. And you can see again and again, there's no difference in the effect of soap alone, cleaning with soap relative to adding the triclosan. So they conclude Antibacterial soap containing triclosan was no more effective than plain soap at reducing bacterial combination when used under real life conditions. So what's important about that? Here the proposed innovation was to create a new compound that will kill microbes and decrease people's exposure. Actually, there are two relevant questions here. Yes, there's the question, does my new compound, in this case triclosan, kill microbes, what we started with. But the second question is, does it work better than current products? In this case, soap. And the answer is, well, soap is really effective, which is the reason that the CDC and the WHO are pushing hand washing in our current situation, right? So this is, uh, this is really the close of the story in terms of that the exercise of thinking about your product, your questions, and what's the appropriate comparison, right? But I wanna just close out the triclosan story by pointing out that with a product that's gonna be in a, in a personal care product, we're, we're interested not only in efficacy, which is what we talked about here, but also uh, we're concerned with safety. And um, what we know about triclosan now is that it has all kinds of negative effects. There's cross resistance to antibiotics. It's an allergen, it bioaccumulates. Um, 
It's an endocrine disruptor. Um, and it's acutely uh, uh, toxic and is carcinogenic in its breakdown products. So, uh, and at this point, it's a really widespread environmental contaminant, despite the fact that in uh, 2017, because of insufficient evidence of efficacy and these many safety concerns, the FDA ruled that it is no longer allowed in over-the-counter personal care products. So, to wrap up, we have this problem and proposed innovation. You're gonna be coming up with great ideas about what can be done to address these problems. But you're going to be using a scientific approach in which you're thinking critically about what needs to happen, what kinds of questions need to be posed in order to evaluate those proposed innovations correctly. And you're gonna be thinking about what in science we call controls. What is the appropriate comparison that you're gonna make between your product that you're developing and something else that will tell you the relative value that your product can bring to society. And when you do that, um, when you're making these connections between those levels, between the, pro the problem, the questions, and the design of your experiments, that is the core of the scientific method, which is why KCS is sponsoring this um, idea pack and uh, what we would like to ask those of you um, who are uh, bringing your background in science to this project with you as you enter these discussions. So thanks for your, thanks for your attention and for your time. Thank you, Susanna. I think that's a great presentation and something that the students will certainly have to keep in mind during the activity portion um, of this event. So I did just want to leave a couple of minutes before we move on to uh, the activity. Are there any um, audience questions of, for any of our uh, expert researchers that they can clarify before we move on to the activity introduction? Please feel free to ask verbally, um, but if you don't feel comfortable with that, you can certainly chat your questions in as well. So any questions? Any audience questions? All right. So at this time, it doesn't seem like there are any audience questions. So I'm gonna move forward with um, introducing Professor Wilkes again. Uh, and he is going to introduce the um, activity that you'll all be working on for uh, the next um, part of the event. So Tom, I will pass it off to you. Thanks, Holly. And uh, I've just reshared uh, the activity guide that I had shared uh, towards the beginning of the meeting in case anyone joined later and uh, was not able to get that from the chat. Uh, so uh, let me uh, share my screen. Now I'm going to present uh, the uh, activity guide uh, that uh, I have uh, just shared the PDF version of. And um, let me go to presentation mode, hopefully. All right, there we go. So in our uh, activity, uh, IT will be breaking us into uh, eight breakout rooms, uh, so eight groups. And uh, in each of the eight uh, breakout rooms, there will be uh, at least a couple of facilitators. Um, I will be one of the facilitators, and all of our um, uh, Difference Maker Fellows are also volunteering uh, to be facilitators as well. Uh, there will also be other uh, faculty members who will be um, sort of bouncing between the rooms as well. And I believe uh, the Dean is uh, going to be visiting uh, various rooms also. Um, and uh, we ask uh, that everyone follow the activity worksheet template uh, and um, Holly is uh, sharing the uh, template in the chat. Uh, so you'll have that available to you uh, when you go into the breakout rooms. Uh, 
The first activity is uh, to uh, identify a COVID-19 related problem. And at this point, you're not looking at a solution, uh, but you're looking at a problem uh, related to COVID-19 uh, that uh, you want to solve. Uh, so uh, we can have as many volunteers within your group as you want, a volunteer uh, a problem. And uh, then uh, the group will discuss those problems and uh, as a group, pick one of them uh, to focus on for this activity. And it's not a judgmental thing. You're basically going to identify one that the group wants to run with, uh, but uh, you could have other uh, problems that are identified that uh, might spark ideas and uh, be uh, things that could be pursued later. Uh, so in the group, uh, discuss why this problem matters uh, to you as a group and then uh, work together uh, to write a proposed hypothesis that describes the chosen problem. And uh, since this is a uh, College of Sciences event, uh, we're heavy on the scientific method, uh, as Professor Rimmel mentioned, uh, uh, we'll be following that method in order to um, try to come up with solutions that are testable uh, for that problem. Uh, and then uh, conduct some preliminary research. Obviously, we have a limited amount of time here, but um, basically this is uh, like a um, uh, mind exercise of um, con conducting the preliminary research uh, to attack your problem. Uh, and uh, discuss possible solutions. This is where the solutions start to come in uh, to the problem. Um, and uh, as you're discussing possible solutions, you really need to think about uh, how can you test uh, those solutions uh, to the proposed hypothesis. And uh, keep in mind uh, the triclosan problem. Is your solution uh, going to be as effective as other uh, solutions that may already exist, or may they even make the problem worse in uh, senses that Professor Remold has mentioned? Um, and uh, Towards the end of the activity, uh, our groups will uh, work together to complete the activity worksheet that uh, Holly has uh, shared. And um, then uh, each group should identify a spokesperson uh, that um, if uh, the group wants to present uh, as problem and proposed solution uh, would uh, be able to uh, talk through that problem to uh, the group as a whole when IT brings us back into the main room. And uh, we're anticipating that each group will have about two minutes uh, to discuss their problem. All right, um, so uh, basically that's the outline of the activity um, and I'll uh, turn it back over to Holly at this point. All right, thank you, Tom. Um, Tom, can you just verify how much time we allotted for the activity portion of the um, Sure, let me just take a look at that. Uh, so we allowed one hour for the activity. Um, so that would take us until about 7.35ish, uh, I guess. And that includes the presentations, correct? That includes the uh, debrief. Uh, it does not include the closing remarks, but the, uh, we only allotted about five or 10 minutes for that. Perfect. So the this next part, the activity portion, everyone will be broken into groups with faculty facilitators. You'll have about 35 to 40 minutes to complete the worksheet as Professor Wilkes discussed, and also keeping in mind all of the points that the three expert researchers presented to you all. Um, so after the 35, 40 minutes, uh, we'll bring you back to the main room, and then teams who want to volunteer to actually present uh, what they've done to the main group will have a chance to do so. Um, and we will give reminders through the chat just so you know when there's about 10 minutes left and five minutes left for the activity. Um, so with that being said, are there any questions before we break you off into your groups? All right, uh, Holly, by the way, I'm not seeing the uh, Word doc in the chat. I, I see that you had um, said that you were gonna share it there, but I don't see the file uh, as such. Yes, so I oh, did. Oh, I do see it. Sorry. Okay. 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 Good. Good. I said I, I did share it. I see it on my end, but I do want to make sure um, it went through. Um, so if there's no questions, uh, IT will now break you into your groups with your activity facilitators, and we'll see you in about 35 to 40 minutes. Welcome back, everyone. I know the activity was a bit shorter than we anticipated, but I did hear from the dean that there were a lot of very exciting and interesting conversations happening within your groups. 
Um, so now is the presentation portion of the event. So I would like to invite back Professor Martin, who will be managing the activity presentation and debrief. So how many rooms did we end up having? Was it eight? Uh, I think, uh, Adam, can you um, validate? I, I believe it was seven because one room didn't have anybody. So seven okay. total. Okay, great. Thanks, Adam. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll go in order from one to seven and I'll invite one person from each room to share out and please keep it, your presentation brief, just the highlights. There was a, a long list of uh, probably 10 different prompts. Don't feel like it's necessary to answer them all, but really just capture what's the kernel of your, the idea that your team developed and maybe, um, yeah, and, and, and what's exciting to you about it. So. Can I have a volunteer from group one to share out? And this will be oral presentations. There's no need to do a screen share. So who's gonna talk for group one? Ideally, it's a student. Okay, so now I'm at a loss here because I don't I know who was in group one. So I can't call on anyone. So. I think I was in group one. Okay, Was my Kayla. group one? Yeah. Yeah, Michael's saying yes. Okay. <laughs> so we talked about the um, about the finances and education. How um, you know the how right now education's being impacted. In the, a lot of schools have gone remotely, and some parents have decided to pull money together and have pods. Well, that's great for some students, but then there's other students who are not receiving that instruction at home. So we talked about that. We talked about a lot of problems. And then we talked about, you know, learning online and the issues from there. I don't know if anyone else in my group wants to add on to something I might've forgotten. Did you have any potential solutions? We never got to that part because we were talking too much about kind of defining the problems. Because again, there's one of the, I guess one of the things was overriding thing was the inequity that has been created by this. That's right. Right, in education and Thank you for highlighting that. for to go, you know, and the students who don't have the resources. So we were kind of trying to whittle down, you know, what is getting it down to a tighter problem, but it was kind of that bigger global inequities that this has caused and how do we deal with that? Thank so, you, Kayla and Michael. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, how about group two? I believe I was group two. All um, right, Ryan. So we each presented a problem and we noticed an overall theme of information, whether it, um, and lack of correct information or lack to access of information. Um, so we, because there are a lot of sources which could either be wrong or misinterpreted uh, for whatever reason, or it could just be right in the moment and then slowly become wrong. And for the person who is not in uh, the so-called elites the, uh, or in academia, it could be hard to either keep up or even know where to find it in the first place. Um, so while we didn't get so far into uh, what the hypothesis or what the solution of this would be, we did uh, say we need a step-by-step -step sort of system to translate uh, what is this new information that we need to convey to the public and uh, get it to by simplifying the language and put it into some mannerism um, to not dumb it down, but to sort of make it into a bite-sized capsule of information where we can accurately display it. Um, we need third parties to be able to go in and make sure we can validate every piece of information we're given, as well as um, don't overcomplicate it. We need to ensure that we're given the information that is needed and not any access information that they could find on their own. Um, and we created the idea possibly uh, instead of having ads that where uh, Subaru or Toyota just thanks our doctors and nurses and our essential workers for them to instead say, this message is brought to you by insert corporation here and then hmm. give 30 seconds of whatever Bit of information we need to project and have it sort of be an advertising agency because there's lack of money as well as overall health is something that's greatly impacted 
um, Patrick talked about immune health, but as well as pre-existing conditions can impact uh, how severe this illness is. So this is not something that specifically needs to be happening during a pandemic, but about every day, wash your hands if it's flu season, make sure you're eating healthy, going on walks, et cetera, et cetera. And that's sort okay. of as far as we got. So it's a messaging campaign and way that's getting the most accurate information out to everyone as best possible. Yes. Excellent, thank you. Well, I love how right now these two ideas are completely different from one another. So let's let's go for team three. Does anyone know that they were on team three? And Adam, you can prompt me for names if necessary. There is no team three, team four. Oh, oh, oh okay. All right, so let's go to, oh, maybe we skipped. So team four. Who is a member of Team 4 and would like to share? Hi, so my name is Shelby and I was a member of Team 4. And some of the things that we discussed was the wide variety and the, the signs and symptoms that patients are experiencing. So we were wondering if we could create a consistent approach in collecting this data. So specifically, the area that this would be best applied is for confirmed COVID patients in the ER. That's where we're most often seeing them. So the possibility of creating an app. So it has a direct approach and it's consistent in getting all signs of symptoms and possibly being able to identify certain signs and symptoms to ranging severity or asymptomatic patients, things like that. It's still a wide gray area right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is, it's kind of related to the, to what Ryan's team of having accurate information. And so this is specifically around capturing symptoms of uh, people, like you said, who are in the ER, so confirmed cases. And you have an idea for an app. That seems like a really actionable idea. Thank you. Excellent. Hey, how about team five? I believe that's me. Um, okay. Is that us, Brian? I totally forgot my own team over. <laughs> Go for it, Brian. So uh, we talked about um, <laughs> the problem with uh, the antiviral drugs on the market that don't work for the SARS coronavirus. Um, I talked about how there are, uh, there's evidence that um, scorpion venom, particularly the Chinese swimming scorpion, um, has antiviral properties towards SARS coronavirus, um, and that it's uh, easily, so to, we would develop it as like a treatment um, as opposed to like a vaccine. Um, and it's by, we could cheat, produce it cheaply by um, genetically modifying E. coli, uh, the same way that they make insulin, um, which it's, it's already been done. So there's already science there um, and yeah. Excellent. All right, so focusing on a treatment versus a vaccine and specifically studying uh, scorpion venom. And then comparing it um, like the, at least the control that we had would be the um, remdesivir, which is mm -hmm. like FDA approved at least, because um, there aren't many or other uh, FDA approved therapies currently on the market. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Okay, team six. Who's on team six and would like to share? See, I thought I was on team six, so I. I Sam, I see you. Uh, do you want to? Is that is that us? Go ahead, uh, Sam. Wait, who's? Yes, Sam. Yes, Sam. It's okay, you. sweet. Um, so the problem that we had, uh, sort of, been trying to figure out an answer to was the fact that there hadn't, there hasn't, there's been a problem with people not, essentially taking things seriously enough. Um, not, uh. They haven't been in compliance as much as they should have. We were trying to discuss um, whether this was due to a lack of information, um, uh, like, or information that wasn't that like certain people, uh, like, like I don't know, due to maybe due to a language barrier, couldn't uh, the the information couldn't reach them. We were also talking about um, how certain attitudes i believe towards um the message uh maybe not the message itself but its delivery and the narrative that is attached to it sort of affects how people will react to the same facts i guess 
Mm -hmm. uh, we hadn't really gotten to the brainstorming a solution part. Um, but... Cool. So this is similar to the, the ideas that team two described, the team that Ryan was part of. So maybe teams two and six can come together after this for follow-up. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so you have two more teams, Adam, is that right? Seven and eight are the last two. Because we skipped over one of the ones in the middle. So I'm gonna call on team seven. Is team seven here? Yep. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Shani Shadev and I'm from team seven. So the problem we were thinking to address is like how to effectively stop the community spread because right now our numbers are greatly increasing and we should come up with some solution to actually stop the community spread. We have contact tracing and everything, but we have thought that we should have some solution like automatic health monitor, especially at large settings like churches, large events, weddings and funeral homes so that they can automatically um, um, detect the people's symptoms and let them know that they should get tested and isolate or quarantine themselves. So we should have some automatic device to make people aware of the virus and then they should stop going into the community and spread the virus. So that's Excellent. our problem and the solution. Thank you, everyone. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Shandi. Team eight, I, if I'm counting right, we do have a team eight. Yes, I'm Adam, I'm from team Okay, eight. Adam, take it away. Thank you. So the problem that we had been talking about um, was with human interaction and environment and the lack of productivity that some businesses are facing, productivity and creativity without people being able to be in person and be face to face with their work team. So um, one example we were talking about was there was an office space, for example, that um, there was a company that that they had gone fully virtual. So they weren't having to pay thousands of dollars a month for the rent for their um, office space. So what we we're thinking of was with the money that um, companies are saving from paying their rent, they could potentially invest that money into rapid testing and give a day, let's say once a week, where teams um, that are working virtually are able to come and get um, rapid testing. And we were talking about the rapid testing that's being done in, um, and developed in the UK where people are being able to spit into a vial in 20 minutes, get their results. So maybe um, adopting that uh, technology and being able to get rapid testing back. And if everyone clears, um, be able to have like a day per week where you're able to be with your team and with all the yeah. money that they're saving, being able to provide food and activities and things like that, just to kind of boost the morale of, and the creativity. And, you know, if it's an eight hour day, spending four hours of work and four of play or, you know, what so have them for whatever they want to do, but just being able to have that thing to look forward to once a week for the team so that they're, you know, always having something to look forward to. So kind of keeping that morale up, I guess. That's excellent. Thank you, Adam. That seems to me it's kind of related to the idea that Shandi just shared of, of on the spot testing so that people know it's safe to be together. So maybe team seven and eight can come together. Um, well, that was great. Thanks everybody. And you all described your ideas really succinctly and it's a really diverse set of ideas. This is really great. Thank you. So thank Holly, you. I'll turn it back to you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so before I pass it off to the Dean for closing remarks, I did just wanna do one more shout out and thank you to all the activity facilitators today, as well as the guest speakers. And I did wanna mention that um, Professor Suzanne Young was also here with us this evening from the Kennedy College of Science and she helped to facilitate a room. Um, so I did wanna give a shout out to her as well as all the faculty fellows and the three guest speakers that we had this evening. and as well as the Kennedy College of Sciences. Um, and then I did wanna leave everyone with a call to action. So I did mention earlier that the $50,000 idea challenge application opens on December 1st and it will close sometime in mid-February. So if you're interested in pursuing an idea that you talked about today or maybe something else or joining a team that perhaps already exists, please do um, visit our website uml.edu slash difference maker and then you can apply at our website uml.edu slash idea challenge app and then we also have two upcoming competition final events in December so if you're interested in actually seeing student teams pitch uh, you might learn something you may meet new people it may help spark additional ideas you're certainly welcome to come as an attendee to either one of those events 
We have one um, co-hosted by DCU and the Manning School of Business, as well as the Francis College of Engineering. Um, so if you're interested in either of those, the links are there. Uh, it's a simple Zoom registration link and you can attend and learn more uh, about pitching and seeing students actually pitch uh, in real life, in real form. Um, so with that, again, I'd like to thank everyone and I would like to pass it off to the Dean now for his closing remarks. Thank you, thank you, Holly. I, um, I just wanna echo what has already been said by Holly and that is uh, thank you all for coming this evening. I think uh, uh, we've learned a lot. We've learned some science, we've learned about the virus, COVID-19, we learned about how it propagates and we learned also about the scientific method, but actually just going from, from room to room and listening to uh, the summary of what you've been discussing today shows great, great promise. I mean, you. Uh, all of you have identified problems that you'd like to work on. I just hope that we can continue this momentum and you can actually uh, do what uh, Holly just said. You can you know, continue to work and possibly work together. There were some ideas that actually may have connections between, between them. And um, I look forward to hearing you know, great solutions and great, uh, to, to this great, great problem. And you'll be contributing to, uh, to finding a solution that is to a global problem. So thank you all. And I again, want to thank the faculty fellows with us, uh, everybody who's here with us who'll be behind this and in particular Holly and her team and, and, and everybody. So thank you so much for, for doing this. It takes a lot of work. And I want to thank also the IT team that's behind the scene here, putting us together. And uh, thank you all and keep at it. And hopefully we will find something that is, uh, will have very positive impact if nothing else, you have to go to, to know each other and work on, on real problems together. Thank you. All right. Thank have you. Have a great evening. Um, have a great evening.